second meeting, it's recommended that the board return to open session. Can I please have a motion? Motion by Mr. O'Donnell, second by Ms. Mitchell. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. Board is in open session. The first item on our agenda this evening is item F, and that is presentations. Uh, we have a presentation on district highlights from this sure. summer and summer programs that we had going on. Mr. Shea, is this microphone for home or for here? Uh, yes. You both? Yeah. All right. So, Dr. McKay, we'll have to use the mic sure. to make sure everybody can hear. Sorry to keep from standing still. Let's walk yeah. away from the mic during the presentation. I can follow him. No, no, that's okay. I just wanted to turn the lights down a little bit just to get some contrast. All right. We've had uh, a great summer and a very busy summer at the uh, in Vernon. Uh, because of the grants, uh, our ESS ER2 grant uh, that allowed us to run the summer programs. There were uh, programs, in, in, the programs in Cedar Mountain were the summer academic camp, also ESY, which we traditionally both have both of those. And then there was an acceleration camp. This first picture is from a field trip uh, with that group during the summer acceleration camp in which they went to the farm uh, at Glenwood. And the farm at Glenwood um, has done a wonderful job of becoming a partner with our school district. So we wanted to highlight um, this great experience with our students. So, as you can see, these are uh, some of the things that happened this summer. Uh, we had a very successful ESY camp. We had a very successful summer academic camp. Uh, and then we had credit retrieval at the high school. So the way it worked at the high school is if we had a certain amount of students who were short on credits and had failed a course or two, we had them in. We were working with our teachers. They were sitting in classes working uh, basically on a program called Apex. And uh, once the students passed that course, uh, there was a, a great celebration. And of course, we moved on. So it was a, a, a very successful program. And then we had the summer accelerated learning camps in five buildings. So I'm going to pass that to you, Superintendent, to talk about that. Thank you. So as Dr. McKay said, we had summer accelerated learning camps in five buildings. You'll see some other pictures in our slide presentation that show very high levels of engagement. As many of you know, or we hope you know, those summer programs were intended both for academic enrichment as well as for social skills with many students who've been out of school for uh, come September would be about 18 months. Sorry, Dr. McKay. Um, those camps served a dual purpose, right? Was to make sure that children were, we were addressing the learning acceleration, which is really important for the academic gaps, as well as social emotional needs of our students because when our children are not in school together, um, they sometimes start to have gaps in social connections. And that's really, really important for us here uh, in school. And we're going to talk a little bit tonight also about the new football field and track, right? Which is so exciting. The next picture, like Dr. McKay shared uh, earlier, this is another shot of Cedar Mountain's summer acceleration program at the farm at Glenwood. You'll start to hear a little bit more about that partnership later on uh, this evening as we talk about <clears throat> our 21st century um, life and careers um, program at the middle school. So the farm at Glenwood is becoming a real integral partner with the Vernon Township School District. And know um, all that's going on there, the weddings that are happening there, et cetera. They've become a vital partner for us. So we're delighted to have them. There's your Cedar Mountain getting out to see the wonderful world around us. 
there was a funny story about that pig. Someone thought it was, a couple of the children thought it was a bear. So they sent someone out with a uh, ATV to try to scare the bear away and we came back and went, no, that's just one of our pigs. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, this summer acceleration at the Cedar Mountain. There's a great team on the right of some of our teachers who worked uh, diligently with the students. Uh, and there's Ben Joseph on the left. And uh, just wanted to point out Mr. Joseph because he's been doing some amazing work here in the library here at Lounsbury uh, and uh, turning it into a 21st century media center. Cedar Mountain also had a very well attended open house today. I had the opportunity to greet many new families. It was really lovely to have our doors open and welcoming our uh, kindergarten students back into the Cedar Mountain School. This we had a summer acceleration camp at the high school, um, and um, this was not as well attended as some of the other camps, and, but this was separate from the credit retrieval. And what this became is really a transition program for some freshman students who are just coming into the high school. So if you look on the right, that was a tour that they were giving to to make the uh, students feel more comfortable. I did have a conversation with a couple of the parents after this camp was over and they were very grateful uh, that they were able to have that transition time because many of the students that were in this camp are new to our district. And that's another big thing that we need to talk about which is the fact that we are having more and more students in our district. So we're very proud of the transitional programs that we put in place and the welcoming that we do. Uh, and we will continue to do that with open houses this year uh, as we move forward. Remember too, the transition to the high school is always challenging. It's a very large building, it can be overwhelming. So uh, the added transition for freshmen was especially uh, welcome this summer. This picture is from summer acceleration right here at Lounsbury Hollow. Um, as you can see, our students were engaged. We talked, they had some wonderful outdoor activities and also <laughs> some indoor activities, again, focusing both on academics as well as social emotional connections with each other. And um, we have noticed with the socialization of our students that the year that they were out, many of them were remote um, and it took a while for them to process um, how to communicate with each other and getting back together and enjoying each other. And uh, so it was a, a very important, this was a very successful and very well attended Lounsbury program. Here's uh, what they would do every morning. They all came into the gym. And of course they got started with their uh, program. Usually there was activities. Uh, also there were snacks, of course, because Sodexo supplied it due to the federal grant. So um, everything was, um, this, this was actually an enjoyable piece in the morning. They usually did it to music. And again, the next picture is for our Rolling Hills summer program, which they called the RAP, Rolling Hills Acceleration Program. As you can see, we had really high attendance in many of our schools. It was a really wonderful opportunity for students and teachers to connect with each other. Um, as you can see, we have uh, students in the classroom, teachers in attendance, um, and we had lots and lots of activities for the children at Rolling Hills as well. Right. And uh, kudos, of course, to our teachers for all the great work that they did. Glen Meadow went above and beyond. They had a morning program and an evening program. And of course, um, they uh, made sure that um, the students were taken care of, especially if they were working during the day or their parents couldn't get them there. They had a nighttime program. The picture on the left is a nighttime program. And then I've got a picture there of gate night at Glen Meadow, which was the end of the school year. I just want to point out how much has been going on since some of us have uh, been in school, that was the gate parent night at Glen Meadow under the tent, <clears throat> which we used exclusively at Glen Meadow. We had the Junior Police Academy graduation. I wanna thank Chief Young for all of his effort with the young men. Uh, this picture was taken a couple of Fridays ago. Uh, this uh, group of young men and women were working with the police department for a whole week. Uh, and it was, uh, it was their graduation picture. So again, exciting things happening all summer. Now on to facilities. This is so exciting. Take a look at the beautiful new turf at Vernon Township High School. Um, as many of you know, we had um, a large scale project that happened over the summer. Um, I, I hate to say without flaw, but it went extremely well. Um, the company we worked with worked rapidly to uh, remove the old <laughs> turf, replace it with new turf, and of course, work on our track as well. So that's them ripping up the old yep. turf on the left there with that machinery. Uh, and this is what the field looks like. Yeah, they really did a beautiful job. And the next 
one more picture of the field. Our, facility, our facilities at the high school, of course, are gorgeous, um, and they did a, a terrific job uh, with this uh, new, new uh, turf. And they also put a track, a new track around, and uh, there it is without the lines. The lines are now painted. Um, that was the day before they were doing the lines. So the facilities, again, at the high school are, are incredible, and uh, kudos to Mr. Foley and his team uh, and to Ms. Linsky for all of her effort on this project. It went, uh, it was flawless. And, and uh, thank you to the board for supporting that initiative. Very, very important for our student athletes. Uh, these, this is our robotics team at the State Fair. For any of you who had the chance to get out uh, to see what was happening at the State Fair, we were represented by our robotics team. It was hot, but they were out with the robots yep. and it really was a spectacular day. You wanna talk about that, Chuck? Yes, yeah. Kudos to Miss Cabe um, and Martin Perringer there in the picture. Uh, the team was there representing Vernon. Um, it, it was one of those really hot days at the fair. Uh, they were under the tent, uh, but um, each of the robotics teams in the county, of course, take a day at the state fair, um, and they were proud of, of their robot, which was firing the ball in the air uh, to that young man. So kudos to the parents who are involved in this program. And uh, kudos to the coaches, uh, Michelle and Sam, and of course, Martin. So congratulations to all of them. All right, the 21st Century Community Learning Grant. We have won $350,000 grant per year in order to form a community center at Glen Meadow. It will be from three to six every day. Uh, we are hoping for 100 to 135 students taking part. It's not invitation. Any student that wants to come from grade six through eight can take part in this. Uh, we are now uh, doing interviews for the project director, the site coordinator, our teachers, and our aides, and our data specialist, and our nurse. So we basically have most of the positions filled at the present time. We'll get them approved on September 9th. The program will open on September 13th. And it is a real addition to the Vernon community to have a school that will be open till six o'clock. Uh, it will be responsible for parent pickup, but there'll be field trips as well as activities uh, for the students. So there's a little bit about the program itself. The high interest clubs, of course, are something that we always stress in all of our buildings, but we would have more of them. And the academic tutoring will happen and sports and activities as well. And then there's six field trips planned for the year. This is a continuing grant. So if things go well this year, and they will, um, we will continue to apply for this grant and, uh, and get it. So it, it really is a, a major uh, bonus for the Vernon community. Great, and also super excited that we had summer professional development for our faculty by our faculty. Um, this, was, um, this has been happening all week at Vernon Township High School. Special thanks to Mr. Shea for creating a tech camp model. Um, and we had lots and lots of people presenting. Um, I got the, I had the opportunity to watch Dr. McKay present, which was very exciting for me. Um, I presented as well. And these are some of our fine teachers and administrators who presented to other teachers so that we can gear up and be ready for uh, the beginning of school when our students return. We would like to, we would like to thank our teachers who presented um, and prepared and also the folks that came. Uh, it's the summertime and they were interested in, in being in the class and, and learning some of the things that were, so there's IT work going on the left-hand side, classroom management um, ideas with Amy Sandler on the right-hand side. And as, as uh, we said before, it was my pleasure to see Ms. Devino and uh, her SEL presentation, which was outstanding. All right, and then right outside of, of Walnut Ridge, we have the coalition working with our students all week. So this uh, was going on all week. We want to thank Mountain Creek. <clears throat> Mountain Creek um, gave us the tents or lent us the tents and set them up for us and also gave food for the students all week long. The coalition was uh, working on all sorts of activities with these high school students um, and it was a great week uh, this week. As hot as it was, the kids were active doing amazing things. Looking for shade, but uh, doing amazing things. And the last slide is just another highlight of our Cedar Mountain students over at the farm. We had quite a spectacular summer. It was almost like having a regular school year, right? Because our classrooms were full, our tents were being used, students were out and about, teachers were in uh, the classrooms with our children. And it was really wonderful to be able to have them on campus with us 
preparing to get ready for when school opens, which for the students is on September 7th. <clears throat> so, congratulations to all of our teachers, to all of our students, all of our parents and families that took part in it. It was really the most active summer I've ever witnessed in Vernon. Uh, and hopefully with the grant money that we have, we'll be able to do it again next year. Okay, thank you, Dr. McKay and Ms. Savino for that presentation. Item G is approval of minutes. Can I have a motion for approval of items G one through five? Motion by Mr. Zimmerman, second. Second, second by Ms. Mitchell. Questions or comments? Seeing none, can we please have a roll call vote? Uh, yes, but abstain is noted. Mr. O'Donnell? Yes. Mr. Zimmerman? Yes. Mr. Nunziata? Yes, abstain is noted. Mrs. Tiger? Yes. Motion carries. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Item H is correspondence. Please note correspondence one through 14. There's two on the addendum. Thank you, and I want to wish uh, our retiring faculty and staff a very happy retirement and thank them for their service to the district. Absolutely, the two people that are retiring, um, just they have, they have given their life to this district. Uh, one is retiring in June, one is retiring immediately, and uh, I want to say to both of them, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you've done for our district. Thank you. Item I is president's report. Uh, we have a 15 page agenda, so I'm gonna keep the president's report very brief. I just wanna say that um, I hope that everyone had a healthy and well rested summer. And I'm really excited to see that our schools are going to be open in the fall, that our students are going to be in the buildings. There's gonna be mitigation efforts in place determined by the state level um, so that we can safely keep our students back in our buildings. But if our students can be learning with their peers, socializing with their peers, learning with their educators, um, back where they belong in their classrooms, I'm really glad to see that. Um, I hope that all of our educators and faculty and staff and administrators and students have a successful school year. Um, and I know that the rest of the board um, would feel similarly and would share those sentiments as well. Item J, committee reports. Uh, on August 3rd, we had a buildings and grounds meeting that incorporated um, our long range uh, plan that we, uh, we spent about six hours, uh, thank you, Ray, uh, touring all the buildings and um, assessing them with our architect. So it was a really good event and we're going to look forward to that report. We are going to meet uh, with Student Life on the 30th at 8.30 in the morning. And that will be a planning meeting where we're going to go over events and plans that we do with uh, Student Life um, to enhance their, uh, our students' uh, environment, so. Great. Any other committee updates? I'll give an update. Uh, this past Monday on August 23rd, I attended the Sussex County Education Services Commission meeting, since I'm a board of directors meeting uh, member there. And we went over the summer, their extended school year, <clears throat> Northern Hills Academy, um, everything that their PTO had done for them. Um, in addition, they have um, child study team members who are very busy and their child, team, child study team members can come out to districts in Sussex County. So if there's whether it's our school district or another school district, um, we can work with their child study team members to come out and work with us. And they have um, with other related services for evaluations, assessment, direct student services, everywhere from High Point, Pittatinny, Sussex Tech, and a host of others. Um, so anyway, it was a very nice informational meeting and learned a lot. So passing along information 
and um, overall a very impressive program that they run there for our students who from Vernon go there and also in general for the whole county. Thank you. All right, I believe that is all the committee report updates for this evening. Item K is public participation. We will begin with members of the public who are here in person, and then we'll go to members, members of the public attending via Zoom. If you would like to comment, please step up to the podium. You'll have five minutes. Please share your name and part of town, and the floor will be yours. Justin, I'd like to just share with the public who are here that have been here for many meetings and we're used to the first public participation being items that are only on the agenda. Uh, the board has changed that to its open public uh, comments, its items that are not on the agenda and additional items also. Because we figured you guys staying here until 1130 at night probably wasn't the thing. <laughs> Thank you for uh, reminding, reminding us all that. Um, that's a positive change and I think that um, it'll be well received. Thank you. My name is Joe Levinsky. I don't have uh, any children in school, but I am concerned about what's going on with uh, critical race theory. Oops, sorry. Um, how is this uh, school district dealing with this? So during the public comment section, it's not a, a dialogue, but uh, if you have information that you'd like to share with the board, during open board member forum or at other points in the meeting, the administration will typically address your concerns. So that would happen at what point? I'm, I, I'm... You can share your comments during the during the public comments section and later in the meeting during open board member forum, members of the board or administration will respond at that time. Okay. All right, but you. you're welcome to share whatever information or you'd like to share at this point. No, no, I just uh, was trying to get a question out so that I could. Uh... Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Judy Storms. And I'm from Glenwood. I've lived here since 1969. I've taught in this district since 1969, 37 years basically. Um, and I love this school district. Um, I am concerned because I, I was here two months ago and I talked to you about CRT, critical race theory. And I'm, I'm still very concerned about it. And I, I want to um, kind of be sure that you really understand what it is. now. I didn't realize, but Governor Murphy in March 2021 signed a bill, number 4454, he signed it into law that all New Jersey schools K through 12 will be taught uh, CRT. And that basically tells our children K to 12 that they are inherently evil if they're white and non-whites are taught that they are victims and uh, the whites are guilty. More than 22 states now have legislation to ban critical race theory being taught in their schools in those states. This New Jersey law has its base in Marxism, communism, uh, with the ultimate goal to create chaos with the confusion that will set up in our children as they're taught these things. And ultimately, it'll destroy our country as we know it. Now, this information, um, last time I was here, I gave you a, each a magazine. And if anybody didn't get it, I brought some extras. Um, and there are other magazines coming out with information. Um, Hillsdale College, and I have a copy from Eva for everybody here and the board. A publication of Hillsdale, Hillsdale College in Primus a critical race theory, and it tells you what it is and how to fight it. So just the idea how to fight it, because I realize you're kind of in a rock between a rock and a hard place. You've got a law, a New Jersey law, the governor signed, he expects our schools to teach this. And I'm just up here to let you know, I don't I find it acceptable at all. And I don't know how you could fight it, but I wish you could fight it. And the only way you would want to fight it is if you understood it. 
And that's why I, I went to the print place and I had copies made of the Imprimus to give you all. But even like I belong to the AMC, AMAC, Association of Mature American Citizens. It's the equivalent of AARP. And it has a whole article on critical race theory. So we've got in Primus, we've got this magazine, uh, another Marxist poison in infecting America. Critical race theory, all the rage in American government schools it is just rehashed Marxist critical theory attempting to divide the country along racial lines. So if somehow you weren't aware of it, honestly, the more I read about it, I didn't know how bad it was. And it's really bad in my opinion. So um, I would like to give these to you, you know, and, uh, and let you know that I am concerned. Again, I have no idea how can you deal with this when the governor made it a law? I don't know what you do about that. So if you don't mind. Yeah, so if you'd like to give those to the board secretary yes. and they will um, they will distribute okay. those to the board members. Okay, thank you. I'll take any questions. Okay. I do have a magazine if anybody has okay. a theoretical question. Sure. Okay. That explains it too. Sure, okay. and thank you for your concerns thank and for you. anybody else who has questions um, on on that topic, the superintendent during the superintendent's report can can address some of your concerns. Hello, my name is Karen Zapula from Highland Lakes. I'm here to speak about the rotating schedule at the high school. For the incoming freshmen who have some have not been in school for 18 months, past 18 months. I heard back from Karen on the policy number that I was waiting for about the rotating schedule. She sent me the same policy that I stated at last week's May meeting, does not mention anything about rotating schedule. And it's also dated back from April, 2005. Because parents were not informed about this rotating schedule, it seems to be a one size fits all for all your students. Sadly, our children with special needs were forgotten and not even considered when this rotating schedule was decided. In the past, parents would receive surveys for parents' input. There was no survey sent requesting parental input on rotating schedules. I'd like to add that according to the school policy 2310 that you sent back to me after I told you about this policy reads, grouping of students, it should be flexible. <clears throat> Uses the word flexible in this policy. There is no flexibility with this rotating schedule and should take into consideration the age, mental ability, emotional needs, physical maturity, interests of each student. Again, it says each student. You're not following your own policy. I also found out from Karen after last week's meeting, Mrs. McDougall, Mr. Frey wasn't even informed about the schedule. They were very important to our children with special needs. Why would they not be informed about this? How would this affect your students with IEPs? Sadly, they were ignored and not even considered. You have no policy about rotating schedules. You did the same thing I did. I did the search, rotating schedules, and got the same policy. Now I would like to know on how you're going to resolve this issue. We are in a pandemic. So many things are so uncertain right now. At the end of school, we were able to not to have masks. Now it's coming September. Now children are going to be coming back wearing masks. Your students have enough to worry about. No one knows in the next few months what's going to happen. Are we going to be in school? Are schools going to be closed down? There's so much uncertainty going on with this pandemic. So do you really think now is the time to change the high school schedule? By doing this, you are not thinking of all your students. So I hope after tonight that you will reconsider the rotating schedule. Please give your students some reassurance. They don't need more stress while we're going through this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Nancy Nazaro. I live uh, I am a resident of Sussex, New Jersey. I have four daughters, three of which are enrolled in the Vernon Township school system. Two are in high school. 
This is my middle child. This is Noel. Noel has an IEP. We are all concerned about the rotating schedule as well. Um, I'm upset and confused with the new student schedules operating on rotating schedules. Firstly, I didn't realize that this was something that required fixing. Also, through speaking with other children within the district in high school, many are unaware of the new schedule format. Um, as you can only view it, prop, your proper schedule given to you if you click on a bell in Genesis. It seems that it would only add to a constant state of confusion, which I believe will detract from the student's overall ability to perform. Instead of there being only a week or so of trying to navigate hallways and classrooms, it now potentially extends into months. Additionally, it is a structure of a regular schedule that pro uh, provides that allows students to know how much time they have to stop at their lockers, take a bathroom break, or even chat with friends. It is my understanding that this schedule has been used previously um, and was met without success in the middle school. I asked the administration to reconsider, reconsider this change and revert back to a more traditional student schedule. Um, with regard to the previously implemented program, um, it was asked that I bring a letter from a previous student of yours. Uh, it reads, to whom it may concern, from hearing about the possible new changes in the daily schedule at the high school, I feel that this rotating schedule would not be the best fit for the majority of students at the high school. Excuse me. It is understandable that some will benefit, those who are more accustomed to change and need the change to perform better. However, high school is the preparation for college and other paths in the future that have defined schedules. College schedules do not rotate, and it's very difficult to plan around these firm schedules as it is. Learning how to study and the best times that you will operate with your schoolwork is one of the best things that I could have learned in high school. With that said, the rotating schedules will not allow this type of planning and learning to be done. I experienced this rotation in middle school, and it was very difficult to get used to. Even at the end of the year, I would go to the wrong class at the wrong time, which is late, and three lates is a detention. Overall, I think that in order to prepare students for college and for life is to train the brains of young and impressionable students to learn to schedule their days and learn how to study. This is the most important for college and other paths of life. Therefore, the rotating schedule won't be beneficial for the majority of students. I thank you, Hannah Van Blarken, High School Alumni Class of 2020. My daughter, Noelle, has an IEP. She's standing here with me. She's not going to speak because she's scared to death. She is shaking like a leaf. However, um, her ordinarily, her excitement of the new school year is being met with trepidation. She's very worried about making it to her classes on time. She's very worried about navigating the school that she barely knows because of the pandemic. She was only a freshman last year and it was very spotty the time that she was in school. So I ask that the board reconsider this or try to do something to alter it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also scared to death. <laughs> um, okay. Hello, my name is Charlize O'Donnell. I live in the Sussex side of Vernon. I'm also a junior in the Vernon High School, and I am new to this, to this uh, district, and I came in February. I came up here today to talk about the new rotating schedule that is now being put into effect this year. I feel as though this new change is very confusing for not only me, but a lot of other students I have talked to, including people on my volleyball team. Personally, I think that school can be challenging enough. Now, don't get me wrong, I enjoy a good challenge, but not one that's incredibly confusing and that can get in the way of my learning. I feel as though my normal first day of school nerves will not go away for more than a month because of the uncertainty of where I'm going every day. Yes, I am aware that there is going to be homerooms in the morning now to explain what rotation day it is, but now our first period class time is going to be cut down even more because of that change. I feel as though these past two years, students and I myself have had to go through so much change because of the pandemic. We had to go to a new way of learning. Virtual learning brought me from a straight A student to a student that almost failed a whole entire marking period. So why change everything else the one year we actually get to come back? At my old school, Lacey Township High School, we did block scheduling. We had four classes a day, and then the next day there were four other classes and it alternated every other day. 
We called them Navy and Cardinal Days, kind of like the gold and blue days we did during the virtual slash in-person part of last year. The block scheduling worked amazingly. We had extra time in class for labs, so there was no um, split lunches. Rather than a long lesson, oh, sorry, um, the teachers had more time to be able to teach us long lessons in one period rather than a long lesson that has to be split into three different days. Even if block scheduling isn't possible in this school at the moment, I feel as though this rotating schedule is going to be more bad than good. I'm more worried about getting to the right class than the actual grades in my classes right now. The pandemic has, got, has done enough to students and teachers. Change has been all around us, and it's been very scary. So why change the one structure we have daily? In conclusion, I would like to leave this with another question that can either be answered now or answered to yourselves. How would you feel being in the student's shoes right now after the pandemic that is still going on? And I just learned that you guys can't ask questions until the end. So I had questions, but thank you for listening to me. <laughs> well done. Great job. Thank you. Good evening. Are we still following the format of signing in? Yes. Please. Okay. Um, I was here on July 15th, I believe it was, um, with my good friend Judy Storms, and we were talking about CRT, critical race theory, and some information, some booklets and magazines were handed out. And there was a comment made saying that, you know, it's been politicized. And I agree with that, it has been politicized, but I did some additional background information on how that kind of got started. And uh, I would just like to share with some people, and just in case they're not familiar. So um, the Marxist School for Social Research, <clears throat> also known as the Frankfurt School, was founded in 1923 in Frankfurt, Germany. It took up Marx's call by creating critical theory. At that time, it wasn't called critical race theory, it's critical theory. I think it was more about class situation, classes of people versus um, you know, what it is now. And the goal of that was to criticize everything existing in the Western society, which included 11 different things. And none of them, to, in my opinion, are good. Creation of race, racism offensive, continual change to create confusion, teaching of sex and homosexuality to children, undermining of schools and teachers' authority, huge immigration to destroy identity, promotion of sex and drink, and on and on, empty the churches. I mean, some of these things we have seen since the pandemic um, a lot of the churches had gone and they had um, shown their displeasure to the federal government saying, we need our faith now more than anything. Why are you shutting down our churches? If we as adults, as people who are in charge of our own bodies, feel that we could go and worship as we feel necessary, we should be able to do that. Well, anyway, after, after that um, little lesson I learned, um, I also had the displeasure of seeing a video clip about this group called Abolish Training Network, okay? And I was horrified. I don't know if anybody saw it, okay? Um, and what it is, is this is Dr. Patina Love in 2020 created this group. And what she wants to do, she wants all white teachers to go through anti-race therapy to stop them spirit murdering black and brown students. This came out of her own mouth. Now, I don't know what spirit murdering is, and I don't know if they ever got an answer. They were asked the question, I don't think they got an answer. I found out that in, in um, spring, this spring, there was a, a COVID handbook that was um, handed to, I think, all districts in the country from the federal government, um, COVID-19 roadmap to reopen, reopening safely and meeting all students' needs. And in that, it's recommended that some of the funds that were given by the government is to use for some race and for race and for social and emotional learning. And in that was a direct link to this group, ATN, Abolished Training Network, right in the booklet. So I wanna know if Vernon got this booklet and if that is true, number one, if that's true, that's horrifying. <laughs> There was information that went out to the Department of Education and they said, oops, it was a mistake. Well, there was a lot of information, a big school, 
a big document ever and lengthy document to include this citation. No, it could not have been a mistake. I'm sorry. If that's the case, whoever wrote up that book should be fired because then they don't know what the heck they're doing. Um, actually, the lady, Cindy Martin, who is, who is in charge or has a high position in the Department of Education for our country, was an advocate for this Bettina Love when she was superintendent of San Diego in California. And she actually invited this, this love to teach how to stop those teachers in her school district to spirit, stop spirit murdering brown and black students. I don't know what the hell this world's coming to, but let me tell you, I grew up, my husband grew up, my husband was like the only white boy like out of like, he lived on an island that we didn't have this kind of thing. This is being brought to the forefront to cause chaotic, to say, listen, because you're white, you're brown, this is, no, we don't do this. This is not who we are as Americans. I'm sorry. This is horrifying me. And I don't, I don't, I don't like, I mean, just, uh, just this lady, Bettina Love, she said, if you don't realize white supremacy is in everything we do, we got a problem. She also tweeted, mediocre, greedy white men are killing us. If that's what's in that COVID book from the government, Shame, shame, shame on this district, on any other district who follows that kind of thing. Thank it's you. Not that, warranted. That was five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. One last thing. <laughs> the rights of the individual are endowed by its creator, not by the governments, that the proper function of a government should be limited to the protection of the rights to life, liberty, and property, and that the individual rights are inseparably linked to individual responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. I took the sign and sheet. <laughs> there it is. Hi, my name is Katie Craig. I not a, I only moved here about seven months ago. So I'm not familiar with certain areas. I live over on 515, um, about a mile up from the center of town. Um, so I wanted to speak just a little bit about my concern on making smaller children wear masks. I don't know if that's okay. Um, so I have two children, one going to third grade, uh, one going to kindergarten. Um, so a young child required to mask up on a bus and then all day has to be unenjoyable and scary. It impacts them psychologically, emotionally, and physically. Kids can't see their teachers or their peers smiling. My son happens to have ADHD. To run to the grocery store for even 15 minutes when masks were required, he had to be reminded several times to wear the mask properly. My son is already shy and struggles. Forcing him to wear a mask all day is only going to make it that much harder. It should be parents' choice. If the masks work so well, then those who aren't wearing one shouldn't pose any threat to the others. Grown adults can go out to dinner and remove their masks as soon as they're seated, so why should my five-year-old be forced to wear a mask for eight hours of the day? It would be considered cruel to put a muzzle on a dog. It's the same concept. No child should need an exemption to breathe freely. Masking children discourages communication, erases facial expressions, which promote emotional intelligence and encourages children to live in fear. According to OSHA, cloth face coverings and surgical masks can't be properly fitted or sealed. Masks have unreliable filtration protection against smaller airborne droplets called aerosols. The carbon dioxide can escape into the air through the mask when you breathe or talk, the same way the COVID virus molecules can easily pass through the mask. I myself am in healthcare and we need to get proper fitting N95 respirators and medical evaluation prior to getting fitted due to the fact that these surgical masks don't do anything. I mean, maybe if you cough, it might cover the cough, but like, it's not like <clears throat> safe enough. Um, so, I don't feel that masks are efficient enough. Uh, so please just reconsider. I just want the children, our children to be able to breathe properly and be happy. Um, and I feel that temperature checks and regular hand washing would be good enough. <coughs> my, my child is five years old and I don't know, I just feel like um, it's gonna be that much more nerve wracking for him. Cause like I said, in a 15 minute time, I have to remind him eight times. Nope, it goes over your nose. Keep wearing it, keep wearing it. And that's another thing. If you 
if you can't see somebody's face and like one of you were talking and I didn't even know who the hell was talking. I, I was like trying to like, <laughs> you, you don't know who's talking. And I mean, I, I'm not trying to um, say it's good for older kids and bad for, I know that's kind of like um, discriminating, but especially I feel like maybe like, like five-year-olds, like my son has ADHD. He's nervous. He's scared. He kind of has separation anxiety. He's going to be <laughs> nervous. And then to wear a mask and not ever be able to see his teacher smiling. And if somebody's talking and you, you don't even know who's talking. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hi, I'm Martin Griffo from uh, Great Gorge area. I'm just noticing with your nice presentation, most of the pictures, whether the kids were indoors or outdoors, were not wearing masks. If masks are so necessary from this point on, why weren't they necessary during the summer months? So that's kind of an inconsistency on your part. Also dereliction. If the adults, they were or were not all vaccinated, that is the question in my mind. Secondly, it's coming out that people that are vaccinated, which the staff for the most part, I've imagined, will be vaccinated, they still can catch COVID-19. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jewel. Uh, I live in Highland Lakes, New Jersey. Um, I just want to kind of talk about the science a little bit. Um, these are studies that the CDC has run. Um, so in total, there has been 78 million cases of COVID in the ages zero to 17 years old. And out of those 78 million, only 361 deaths actually occurred. It's the same as the flu. 477 flu deaths in these same children ages 0 to 17 died in the years 2018 to 2019, 477. The year prior, 643 kids died due to the flu. And I don't remember anyone taking any of these mandates or any restrictions for the flu for these kids. The flu is more dangerous to these children than the actual coronavirus. With that being said, on top of that, in the year 2019 to through 2020, there was 38 million flu cases reported and only 1,800 flu cases were reported in the years 2020 to 2021. I wonder where all those cases went. Does it make sense? We are doing things that are not useful, which is why we are still having this problem. Coronavirus and all other respiratory viruses are spread by aerosol, aerosol particles, like Ms. Craig had priorly said, which are small enough to go through every single mask. Ma'am, ma can you please raise your mask? Thank you. Those are, <laughs> those are studies done by the NIH and the CDC, which they are blatantly, blatantly ignoring even after they had funded to get these tests done. That is why there is still struggle over this. You cannot make these viruses go away. The natural history of all these viruses is that they circulate all year long, waiting for the immune system to take a hit through the winter or become deranged, which is what is occurring right now with these vaccinations. Why are we doing things for this virus that we have never done for any other respiratory virus? Examples being common cold, influenza, bronchitis, pneumonia, and many more. The government has watched people die every single day from lack of healthcare, homelessness, crime, drugs, the list goes on. Every single day for decades, they don't even blink an eye. And now they want you to think they deeply care about our safety, our children's safety, over a fatality rate that's less than 1%, the numbers were inflated. Those who died of COVID had comorbidities, were obese, 
and had other issues relying on that. This is not about our health, it never was. A new study has concluded that children born and raised under pandemic restrictions have significantly reduced verbal and motor cognitive skills. If this doesn't concern you, I don't know what will. I would like to leave with three quotes. Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. Our constitution, well, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God by Benjamin Franklin. Our constitution is an instrument for the people to restrain the government by Patrick Henry. Questioning your government is terrorism, the Biden administration. <laughs> Are there any other public comments from? My name is Isis Lopez and I'm from Highland Lakes in Vernon. And I just wanted to touch on the whole mask thing. Me, myself, as I walked in earlier, barely being able to breathe was forced to put it on. And I'm just, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't understand why in the pictures that you guys showed earlier, just like she said, everyone was, they didn't have masks on. They were free to express themselves, to smile, to have a good time. And now going back to school, they were told that we're, it's mandatory again. Can it just be optional? <clears throat> I'm not here to say that I'm fully against it or out of rebellion. It's out of the facts that have been studied. As a mom of three, I'm very concerned for all of our children and their health. If a student or a teacher wants to wear a mask because it makes them feel safe, then so be it. But they shouldn't be forced to. Why? Because masks don't work. They Right now, I'm having trouble breathing as I'm speaking. Adversity is affect respiratory physiology and function, asthma, and COPD, it worsens you being able to breathe because like, you have to take more breaths. It lowers blood oxygen levels, promoting carbon dioxide in the blood, which can lead to a heart attack, you collapsing. The kids, I have two, two kids right now in school, in the school district that told me last year they had to wear a mask during PE. How during PE are you supposed to be able to breathe if you're wearing a mask? I don't understand. Like, are we trying to make them collapse? Do we want these kids just like falling over because they can't breathe? I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> this right here is a breathing ground for all kinds of bacteria because of the warmth coming out of the breath. So if I have a virus, I'm worsening myself by breathing it out just by talking because of the heat and humidity within this diaper. It's a breeding ground for bacteria, mold, all kinds of viral infections. It's, uh, I can't. I'm sorry, I'm trying to, I get like very, I myself felt alienated, like I said before, when I walked in and I'm being told I have to put it on. I can't say, I don't wanna disclose my medical conditions as to why I shouldn't have to wear this to come prove or save a point. If the person feels they are safer and they want to wear a mask, then so be it. It is a false sense of security is what I am saying. And these doctors have said the same thing, but no one listens. No one is opening their eyes to do a little bit of research. Where are the statistics? Where's, where's any type of knowledge being said? Okay, do, do these really work? No, <clears throat> these don't work. N95s do, and they have to be fitted to someone's face. Like she said before, like earlier. So I don't, I, I really don't understand. Like, like it's, I'm just saying it should be, an option, you know, because especially during PE, zero, I don't get it. I don't get it. And I'm like all over the place because I can't breathe and my glasses are fogging up. And that's another thing you're breathing out. I have sinus issues. The bacteria from my sinuses go up into the mask, up into my eyes. And I've gotten eye infection after eye infection after ulcers in my eyes because of the chronic sinuses. 
that I'm breathing into the diaper. I just want to say that the lockdowns were not effective. Masks are not effective. School closures sure as hell were not effective. Remote learning wasn't effective. The mandates that are, they're not effective. There's evidence that clearly shows after how many months of us going through this, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. We got a little bit of freedom in the summer and now we're going back to the same thing. Why? Because it's gonna be flu season when flu season is all year. If it's a virus, it's all year. It's not gonna be like, oh, it's peak time. I just wanna know if it's gonna be something that's gonna be forced onto the kids or if it's going to be where it's optional for those who feel safer wearing it. Thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. I am here um, in person to speak about the mask mandate. As I mentioned last week, there is a very low rate of children getting COVID. Uh, on the <clears throat> CDC website, it shows there is a 97 to 99.75 recovery rate, according to the CDC website. Their site shows that children age 5 to 14 years old have a 0.2 chance of passing from COVID. Kids have a higher chance of having a car accident and dying from COVID with a 1.9% rate. <clears throat> the rate of drowning is also higher with a 2.8% of dying from COVID. Wearing masks are more dangerous to our children. They can cause serious mental health conditions. They are not able to communicate effectively. They can't see facial expressions. As I stated last week, according to the study done in Ireland, it can increase anxiety, carbon dioxide in the blood. Do you, do you know where masks are made of and what conditions they are made of? I mean, I've seen horrific videos of the way that they're made. They're, they're, the, the environment is not cleansed. <clears throat> um, what kind of chemicals are in these masks? I mean, we have to look into this a little further than just going according to whoever's orders and saying, do this, and we do it just because we're told to do it. Um, we have, uh, I saw a report of parents that took masks to be examined in labs. And the results found, just to name a few, pneumonia and uh, parasite uh, causing bacteria. Whenever I wear the mask, I feel horrible. I feel like I'm gonna pass out. Um, I mean, I, I think this is ridiculous to have to force people to wear a mask. It's scary to see how parents would allow their children to be exposed to these dangerous effects that are proven there are no studies showing that kids are gonna be safe by wearing a mask. How can we allow our children to have to wear them for six to eight hours a day? I feel if a child can take off their mask during lunch and take their mask <clears throat> off at gym time, then they can take it off all day long and be safe. How is it that we can walk into a restaurant and sit down and there's no COVID and we walk out of the restaurant and we gotta put a mask on and what, there's COVID at that point? Please, like we have to think logically. I mean, common sense is really not so common these days. Um, I understand people have medical conditions and are scared of getting sick. If you wanna be safe and you feel that that's the best way for you to protect yourself and your children, then go ahead and wear a mask. That is, that is fine. It should be my choice as a parent to decide if my child wears a mask or not, not the governor's. The child came out, out of me, no one else. I have... <laughs> To all the parents who decide that their kids will be protected by wearing a mask, then you shouldn't have to worry about my child having one or not, or look at my kid any differently because they don't have one. We have not got COVID, luckily. And as I stated last week, my mom had cancer, 26 years. She did not get COVID. I took care of her very well, thankfully, and she did not die from COVID. <clears throat> all these reports that are seeing, I was talking to someone the other day, yesterday actually, she told me her uh, mother-in-law died at a nursing home and they put COVID on there. They didn't even die from COVID. They weren't tested for COVID. None of the people that died there were tested for COVID. The government is lying. 
We are all here to advocate for our children because we want the best for them and our families. We must find a solution for the situation, please. If everyone here that believes that masks um, are okay and that the CDC website is telling the truth and the numbers are correct, then if the rates are so low of infection, why even submit your kids or subject your kids to wear a mask? They didn't get COVID in June when the mask mandate was removed. I have two kids. My daughter is going to eighth grade. She wants to go back to school. We will not allow her to go to school wearing a mask. We just saw these beautiful <clears throat> pictures. I mean, that word, my heart to see all the kids next to each other. There is no difference now in September. I feel we should have a choice, either optional mask or virtual classes. And again, I don't want my child to have to go to virtual class. I would rather her come here because she needs to interact with her friends. She wants to be here. I have another child going to kindergarten. He is so excited about school. And now I'm going to have to pull him out. I mean, I'm not even going to register him. I know that this is a very difficult situation. And I ask that you please speak out for our children. <clears throat> speak out for your children if you have. Request that the masks be optional. Thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Ed Karwaski. I live over in Lake Conway. I'm here because my statement is about what I hear here. I hear a bunch of concerned parents and grandparents, and their concern is that government, both state and federal, are doing what they're usurping parents' rights over their children. They're trying to say, well, you, you don't, you're, not, you're not doing a good job teaching your children about race theory. You're not good at doing a good job about respecting your neighbor and wearing a mask to protect them if that's what you're, you feel you should do. And what's happening is we see coming down the pike in all kinds of different programs funded by foundations with an agenda that in giving money, they're, they're projecting on the school board and the school system certain things that they want to implement in our schools. Our schools, when I was a kid, was to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic, the three R's. Uh, science is there and everything else, but we weren't there to teach, or, teach the kids morality. We were there to teach, give discipline and teach and educate. But we weren't supposedly the, the backbone. Our teachers weren't to teach us morality. Okay, Our parents at home and our grandparents taught us morality and how to treat one another and respect one another. So what's happening, I'm seeing today that foundations with an agenda and big government are implementing programs in the school systems that are bringing up these issues like critical race theory, uh, LGBT rights and all these different things. And I was on the internet the other day and I happened to get a hold of some information. And th this thing is a bulletin by uh, New Jersey, Hold on one second, let me get it here. Well, it's a program that has to do with principals and the schools and it's called an in-flight program. And I noticed that they have a grant to teach cultural diversity audit in the school systems. And Vernon High School happens to be one of the schools that's part of the, this pilot program to teach cultural diversity. Just to read the top line on it, it says you recognize the importance of strengthening diversity and equity practices and practices in your school and district. <clears throat> are we lacking in that here in Vernon? I don't know. I mean, we are 80%, 86% white, but I don't think any of the white people in this community are racist mm -hmm. or have an agenda against their fellow brother or sisters. They're quite intelligent people and they're not racist and they don't criticize people for who they are. And then I find that there's two foundations behind this. And now all of a sudden they're trying to uh, bring in a, another program, which is going to implement in schools 
uh, how they can look at trauma, okay? Trauma in students. Well, we got a lot of trauma in students with the pandemic right now. We have a lot of problems, but it's nice for the teachers to recognize that and give guidance to get those children help where they need it. But does that help come from the school or does it come from spiritual counsel in their church or their doctor or their psychiatrist or their social worker? You know, uh, maybe this program is to make teachers aware of that. I don't know. And help them to implement what needs to be done for those children. But as I'm, I'm looking at these things and I'm looking at the comments I'm hearing, it seems that parents are sort of left out of the loop of these things happening. I don't know, did, did Vernon inform the parents in Vernon that the high school was going to have a, uh, this project implemented in the Vernon High School? Uh, as far as this in-flight project about critical, should say cultural diversity audit? I don't know. I, I, my son hasn't mentioned he's gotten a letter about it that that would be implemented in the school, but I just happened to come across it, you know, in some research. So my heart is that the parents, the grandparents in this community have a right to know what the board, the school is doing, okay, about implementing certain education and programs, but also that we're here to contribute and help you <clears throat> to help educate our children. But that responsibility is on us first before God. We're supposed to raise up our children. According to the word of God, we're supposed to raise up our children. And we are having you as people who are coming alongside us to do that. And we, we believe all of you have good intentions here to do that. But what happens is lately, as we see with big government, Thank federal, you, that was state, five minutes. there's so much being mandated. So I just like to have somebody comment on that later, maybe off the record and give me some help as to how that's going. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Shane Rodriguez. I'm a was a local resident to Vernon. I went to the Vernon schools my whole life, and uh, we all had the freedoms to go to school uh, without masks on. And there was plenty of viruses. I remember specifically in this school uh, when, when I was in um, fifth grade, the swine flu was was out H1N1, and that was a a big fear of all of our uh, classmates, teachers. I remember a lot of teachers were seriously like scared about it. There was no masks yet. After people were given vaccines, I saw on the CDC's website today, over 40,000 people were uh, had severe issues or ailments with their body from vaccinations. And that vaccine came out, I'm pretty sure it was about eight months after the H1N1. And I see a consistent pattern from 2001 all the way up to 2021 with a, I'm just gonna call it a government pushed fear-based <clears throat> virus that's coming out. And there's a list of them from bird flu to now. And I think now somehow they got us on their hook and really hooked us in with this whole, you know, you have no immune system and you should be living in fear and cover your face. And I just find it a little ridiculous because this whole pandemic since it started in 2020, uh, I had lost my grandmother. She was ill. She had serious pneumonia and issues. She did have, you know, viruses throughout the whole time. But um, my, um, my cousin, her, um, her grandfather, he passed away a year later due to the similar issues. He had diabetes and he had some issues. But when he went to the, uh, the hospital, uh, they, they had listed it that he had COVID. So when he went in there, they, uh, they didn't bathe him, they didn't shave him, and they didn't let any of his family members come see him. And I was allowed to go see my grandmother when she, before she passed away, which was, which was good, but it wasn't fair to my, my cousins and my family. I don't know if any of you have had any family members go to the hospital, but if you're on a ventilator and you're under and you are not conscious, but you can hear things in the room, except for your family and all this other crazy trauma going on, I don't see how that's fair and how you'd wanna live, especially if you're under for more than a month. And, ex and it's extremely alarming to me that these hospitals are being cashed out in checks from the CDC in $30,000 format, just for writing it on the death certificate, whether it's true or not. And I also find it extremely scary that they don't do autopsies, which is very, very, very soul rattling. I'm gonna move on to what I wrote down. Just wanna start and ask, all of you, when it comes to health and wellness, when was it normal to offer a free Krispy Kreme donut, Sonic cheeseburger, 
for proof of a vaccination ID. Those are cancer causing sugar filled foods that are nothing but problematic to your health. That would be like them giving you a bush light or a beer for having your vaccination ID. I don't know what the story is with that. They're even offering free Uber rides and Lyft. They are pushing this in our face and they're throwing the scientific method out the window, literally out the window. It's mind boggling. And now they wanna have our kids cover their face. My son is one years old. Okay, if he has to come to school, in three or four years with a mask on his face. I don't care how old they're saying five, I think five or six is the cutoff. That is extremely, extremely alarming. And I wouldn't send my kid to school either. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> I find it amazing that local businesses, especially around here, were hit the hardest. Yet Walmart and Amazon, all these super stores were allowed to stay open while all of our friends, families, people that we all know had to suffer. And I watched that for a year and a half and it's very, very alarming. And you can see all these red flags that I'm pointing out. And when it, when it looks like a duck walks like a duck, it generally is a duck. And from seeing this, I'm 24 years old. You guys are all much older than me and have experience. Maybe besides Justin, I went to high school with. Other than that, uh, you know, I think you guys could all see where the red flags are coming up. And they're coming up every hole. And we're at hole number 10 right now. So <sighs> one more thing I'll say before the cutoff. If the government truly had our backs and these vac vaccines were safe, <clears throat> why isn't insulin free? Why isn't cancer treatment free? But uh, this vaccine is free and I'm seeing a lot of issues with that. So that's all I have to say. Everyone. My name is Ariella Bias Craig, and I'm from um, Vernon, New Jersey. And I thank you all for allowing us to come here and speak our voices in truth. To start off, I'd like to say that I know that people have passed away from COVID, and my love is sent to them and everyone in this room dearly. But this goes deeper than we think. For our children to wear a mask and take all their expressions away is wrong. And at the bottom of our hearts, we all know that. This is their biggest stages of growth and they need to see each other. They need to see each other's faces. They need to verbally talk to each other and they need to experience. We are free. What if we were all children having to wear masks at school? How would we feel if we just put ourselves in these children's spots? It's abuse and we wouldn't put a mask. If we wouldn't put a mask on an infant, then why would we put a mask on our children that are a few years older? It's time we start coming together and not separate and start taking accountability for our health and our children's too. We have a choice to either keep letting the government feed us lies or we have a choice to start speaking up and fighting for our rights. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public attending in person who would like to comment? <laughs> okay, at this time, I'm gonna to go to members of the, oh, go ahead. I just think um, people are voicing their concerns. There's a lot of people who can come tonight, but um, I'm certainly here to say you have a decision to make. Not that you um, won't consider this or you won't consider what the government's telling you to do. I think it's our position that we, the people, are the ones that say what goes and what doesn't go. And that's what our constitution backs us up on it. And, and at this time with the confusion all going on, I, I feel that um, <clears throat> you should seek in your heart and you should seek in your right and as you as parents or whatever, that the people should decide, nobody else. And if they want to wear a mask, they should wear a mask. If they don't want to wear a mask, it'll work out. It'll work out because the truth does come out eventually. And any problem that arises from that, you deal with it. But I have faith that this, this COVID is, is a farce, it's false. There's something over our country that's evil and it's affecting everybody day by day. 
I don't know if what you think, there's not much where you can communicate with the townspeople, but I don't even have kids in the school, but I live here and I'm concerned for my neighbor's kids, these people's kids, I'm concerned about America. We have a constitution, follow the constitution. We are the people and we demand that we have our rights that we don't have to wear masks. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'm gonna to go to members of the public who are attending via Zoom. If you are attending via Zoom and would like to comment, please select the hand raising option and you'll be admitted into the meeting and you'll have five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, first, I want to make a, I want to make a comment on the comments. I want to speak regarding schools, uh, what the heart was put indoctrinating children. Yes, schools too. That's the job of school. Schools are supposed to make uh, citizens. They always have been, and they always have been a reflection, a mirror image of the society that we live in. And the school system today is a mirror image of the society that we live in. Not necessarily a mirror image of Vernon, but a mirror image of the state of New Jersey of the United States. Regarding critical race theory, the state of New Jersey schools must begin age appropriate lessons about diversity and inclusion, and they must promote economic diversity, equity, inclusion, tolerance, and belonging in connection with gender, gender sexual orientation, race, and ethnicity, disabilities, and religious tolerance. It doesn't say nothing here that white people are bad. It doesn't say nothing black people are bad or anybody else is bad. It says, speaks about tolerance and inclusion. Now you can take any subject and make it racist and non-inclusive. I can make mass racist by just posting a problem that says, there's a room full of 10 undesirable. I take five undesirables out, how many undesirables are left? Where you can fill in your own matter of what to consider an undesirable. And with their, now all of a sudden mass is racist. It is up to the school, it says age appropriate. And that is at the start of it to teach. Now, I've been going and been involved with the school district since 1995. And there were very, very few incidents in, in this school district where a teacher has done something age up inappropriate. And we make lesson plans in this town and in any town and lesson plans are public. And when a teacher goes against those lesson plans, it usually, to my experience, has been handled. So, Let's be age appropriate, let's make our lesson plans and let's be tolerant. As for the masks, I just say shortly, look at Texas. They turned a couple of cancer patients away because the hospital was full today. And that didn't come from just anywhere. Those are people on ventilators and are sick. As for masks, we didn't use masks, the numbers went up. We used masks, did social distances, the masks, the numbers went down. We stopped using the masks, the numbers went back up. I think we made a very clear uh, test for ourselves. We made an experiment. If you want to, you can look at other countries, mostly Asian countries, who have been wearing masks for decades against the flu and stuff because they don't want to die from the flu either and pass it on. The mask doesn't protect you. It protects the other people around you. A doctor, when he operates on you, and the nurses in the hospital, they don't want wearing a mask to be safe from you. They might put one on you to keep them safe. They wear a mask and a face shield to protect you. 
and efficient also for other reasons. I just wanted to, I see too many one-sided research here. Please research from all sides and please remember, go vote. We are supposed to have a representative democracy. Our government is here to represent us. It can only happen if we as citizens, as informed citizens, make an informed decisions on who we vote in. We at this time do not have the capability to hold a vote on everything, otherwise nobody would do any work. So go vote and then be a good citizen and accept the result of the vote. And that's the government that represents the majority of the people. And lastly, always be civil. All Thank right. you, Martin. Thank you. Bye. That was five minutes. Okay. Matt, is anybody else raising their hand? Yeah, we have a few. Hi. Hi there. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Amanda Reeker. I'm from Glenwood, New Jersey. Um, honestly, I think the caller before me, I believe his name is Martin, said pretty much everything I wanted to say. Um, but I'm, I also did want to add a few things because as I listened tonight, I just felt more and more livid over a few things that were said. Um, one, I want to thank you guys again for having to put up with this because it's absolutely ridiculous that, that you have to put up with this. Um, the mandate was passed. Nothing's going to change. So thank you. there's one. Thank you. There's one person who has the floor. I'm going to ask you to please remain. respectful. I was respectful during you guys. So you guys can be respectful now. Um, on top of that, it's not going to change. I know you are all there hoping it will, but it's not going to focus on things like the rotating schedule. If you're upset about that, you know, focus on other aspects, but this is not going to change. And on top of that, to hear people again say only 300 or so or 400 or so kids have died, regardless if it's from the flu, driving accidents, whatever, <clears throat> kids dying is a horrible thing. To add a big old butt after that is disgusting. And I hope to God none of your children ever get sick. Doctors and nurses wear masks in the neonatal units and in NICU when kids get sick. They've been doing this for decades. It's not anything new. I go to a cancer clinic where all the doctors and nurses wear masks. It is not anything new. To hear people possibly make up debilitating diseases just to get out of wearing a mask is horrifying to people that are actually sick. On top of that, if you are that sick, maybe you shouldn't be in public at a meeting. Um, it's, I've heard people say, where did the flu numbers go tonight? Well, we all wore masks for a year. That's where the flu, ma the, the numbers went. When we wore masks and we had kids home and we were doing virtual and all of that, the numbers went down. And that's literally a fact. You can go find those numbers. The minute we stopped doing that, the numbers went back up again. It's not difficult to see that. On top of that, the majority of people that are against the masks are probably the reason that we're stuck back in this again because you don't wanna wear them. You wanna go out and socialize. You wanna have your kids out and socializing. To be honest, I do too. I wanna to get the hell out and socialize and I want my kids to socialize. But at the same time, we have to be cautious. Kids under certain ages cannot be vaccinated. These are our children. And a lot of you I hear you say, my kids, my kids, my kids. Think of other people's kids. Think of everyone else in that class. Think of the people that are sending their kids to school wearing masks because it's the right thing to do for your kids' protection. This should not be political and it got made political and it's absolutely disgusting that it did. Again, I sit and I see kids go in for chemo treatments. I go in for chemo treatments. People are wearing masks for hours at a time and then also wearing them during their chemo treatments while they're out and about after the fact because they have to for hours again. And once again, if you have a medical condition where maybe 
you are immunocompromised and you're complaining at a meeting about wearing a mask, stay home, honestly, call in. Vernon gives us this hybrid option for a reason. You know, it's not something that you should just throw on the pile of everything else. On top of that, as uh, Martin said, these have been pretty one-sided arguments of data and quote news that's been looked up by people that are not scientists. Um, I feel that we should absolutely follow the scientists, the people that have studied for years for their jobs and researched and done peer reviews, not people that maybe barely graduated high school and have a YouTube channel. Also, anyone that uses the term Marxist should immediately be disavowed as being listened to. Because if you wanna have a respectable conversation with anyone, they're just gonna tune you Hi out everyone, I'm trying to listen that. to the speaker. We have one speaker at a time during our meetings. Thank you. Yeah, you Sorry, go on. <laughs> Seriously. Um, the we fact have, that you're there in have, numbers doesn't we mean We have one speaker at a time are, during our meetings and the speaker has a floor. You are the loud minority. You are not the majority. The reason a lot of us aren't there that are pro-mask is because of the fact that we know it's gonna go through and that our board of ed is not writing a letter to our governor. They already said that. So thank you. That was again, fiber. thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Matt. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. You have five Hi. Minutes. Okay. <clears throat> it's Barb Munchauer. I live in Wanage, but I am a, a teacher on now in Rolling Hills. And I did want to answer some of the questions that came up so you didn't have to wait till the end of the meeting for open board forum. Um, I did work the summer program at Rolling Hills, the RAP program. At that time, the number of cases were down and the governor was not requiring us to wear masks. And so the reason that you're seeing all those pictures online with children without masks in school was because it was not a requirement at that time. We were able to have smaller size classes. We had them spread out. We got them outside quite a bit. There was a lot of hand sanitizer and hand washing, but it, the cases were not at a number where the governor felt that we needed to have the masks on. Um, however, as of, I believe, uh, August 9th or 10th, we received an email that once we were to come into buildings, we would be required a mask as soon as the governor put out that order. And I apologize if I have the date wrong. Um, I have been in school quite a bit since that time. I have been required to wear a mask. And um, you actually saw a picture of me teaching a class today. You will notice that not only was I wearing a mask, but my colleagues were wearing a mask as they were taking the class. We take this very, very seriously. To reiterate, um, the 2% or the 1% or whatever percentage of children have died from COVID, is that many children too many? I could never live with myself if I caused a child to become ill and they or someone in their family passed away or had serious complications from COVID. I could not live with myself if I caused a family member to die from anything. I have been respectful and not visited friends and family who are in compromised situations. And my students that were, did manage to come back last year because I was a virtual teacher, I made sure that we followed every protocol possible. It was not the best and most fun activity, but these children are flexible, they are resilient, and we want them back in school. We want them to see their peers. We want them to learn from us. So if it's with a mask on, you'll see me with either Donald Duck or a dog face or a colorful mask, and we make it fun. We want your children in school. We want every child to be safe. When they cannot be vaccinated, they are not safe. And that's not just from COVID. That's right. from anything. Listen, that we don't allow children to interrupt during class. We don't allow interruptions during our meeting. This is a public meeting. When we have speakers, we have one speaker at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nunziata. Um, we are doing everything in our power to get your children back into school so that they can learn and be with their peers and have their social skills and everything that's been kind of rough the last year and a half, <clears throat> we wanna bring it back, but this is our new normal. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but I have lived through a lot of things in my lifetime and this is a pretty bad one. And I'm gonna do everything I can to keep your children safe and let them learn in the best environment possible. And so is every single one of my colleagues. 
I am not going to teach your children to hate or to be mean or to be angry. I'm teaching them to be accepting, just as I taught my own two children. If, if you have any questions, you certainly can reach out to me. You can reach out to anyone in the Vernon school system. We are all here because we want to teach your children. And yes, I understand what it is for your child to come in all day in a mask and be on a bus because I'm there an hour or two before school starts and I'm there after and my mask is on. It isn't fun, but it's what we're doing right now. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, are there any other hands raised? There are two. Thank you. Hello, can you hear us? Okay, Matt, maybe we need to go to the next public comment. Hi, Natalie, can you hear Hi. us? Yep, I can hear you. I wasn't sure when I was gonna get unmuted. This is Natalie Bucheri in the Sussex part of Vernon. Um, and um, I, I know you're not going to stand up for our students and our staff who want to be math optional, and I am disappointed in that, um, but I know you're not going to. But I am going to ask, mm -hmm. um, I believe the governor's orders did say that during any physical exertion, which would be gym class, um, during lunch, and anytime students were outside, that they did not need to wear masks. Um, I know there was a lot of inconsistency just from my personal experience with my daughter um, on when classes were inside or outside or when masks were allowed during gym. Um, so I would hope, and, and you've probably already done this with your building administration and through um, Mr. Foley and the athletic um, department and gym, but I would hope that it's consistent for every grade in every school that any time a child is in gym class, they are not wearing a mask um, and that teachers aren't in the position to make a determination what is physically exerting to someone. Um, you know, and because that's a tough position for a teacher to be in because what might be an exertion for one student um, might be nothing for another student. You know, I could, what's going to be physically exerting for me is probably not going to be for a young, healthy teenage athlete. So I think that would be a really tough position for, for the teachers to be in. So I would hope that you're consistent with a policy for every building, every gym class, that when those students are in gym, as per the governor's orders, they are mask optional. And that when they're in lunch, they are mask optional. And when they are outside, they are mask optional. Because I believe that is the standard. Um, and of course, parents, if parents choose, that their child remain masked during those times. I'm sure they can, you know, contact the building principal. They can contact the, um, you know, the teacher specifically, and I'm sure that they would honor that parent's request. But I, I, I know there was a lot of inconsistency, and there was inconsistency from the governor's office. So I don't fault um, the teachers for that. I just think it would be a very difficult position for them to decide when that's, you know, when there's physical exertion. Um, so I, I hope that you've worked on that already. If you haven't, I hope that would be something that would be consistent in every building. Um, and I am I am disappointed. I know there's a lot of districts that have stood up for um, parents' rights to be mask optional. Um, I know there's discussions going on in Sparta, Lafayette, Wanted, Middletown, um, Tom's River, <laughs> Wayne, New Jersey, you know, Wayne and, and Pacific County, not too far from us, a lot of towns. And I am very disappointed um, that not one board member, not one administrator will stand up. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Are there any additional comments? Sure. I hope, can you hear us? Hi, sorry, I had my phone unmuted and couldn't figure out what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, no my name is, oh, sorry. Um, I'm in Highland Lakes. Um, so I my comments are mostly about 
uh, making updates to the safe return plan um, that was presented to the community back in July. So one of the bullet points obviously has changed the mask mandate that the governor has put into place has um, obviously made the first point of the safe return plan invalid. And I, I, I have a whole list here, but it's just too much to go through. So I wanted to ask if the administration will consider updating the plan so that we can go through those bullet points that are on the plan, such as, um, are you still doing the fogging cleaning? Or, um, uh, what kind of process will be put in place to make sure kids are wearing the right kind of mask and wearing them properly? Um, what kind of other social distancing measures will be put into place, especially given that most of the school buildings will be filled again, and some of them were, you know, 75 to 80 percent full all of last year. So basically, my, my question is, will the administration be working on updating the community about what has, has or hasn't changed since July in that communication? And um, I really appreciate all of, you know, your efforts over the past year. And to the, the members of the audience who keep bringing up CRT, I have to say, this is a university level program. It is not taught in K-12 schools. And it's really okay for us to talk about racism and white supremacy and analyze their roles in our country's history. The kids can handle it, so trust them. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, are there any other hands raised at this time? Okay, thank you. We're gonna close it to the public at this time. And at this point, we're going to go on to item L, which is the superintendent's report. Mr. Nunzio, yes. can I please make a, su a suggestion or a request that if there are board members that do want to provide some feedback to the public, it is getting a little bit late, no matter what, we're going to have to be here for the same amount of time. So could we maybe provide some feedback? These people came out. It's up to you or the board. But if somebody wants to provide feedback, I think now would be a better time only because there's so many people that came out. I'd like to request so, that if possible. So I know that during the superintendent's report at this time, Ms. Devino is going to address some of the concerns from members of the community. And that may that would be an opportunity for us to invite some dialogue among, amongst the board members as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nunziata. Thank you so much for coming out this evening, folks. And certainly just like Mr. O'Donnell said, in consideration of all of your time, rather than going into my superintendent's report, which is um, pretty brief anyway, I'll do my best to answer some of your questions because you brought up a lot of really valid points. Um, the two items that I will probably cover first are um, critical race theory and masks. Um, and forgive me if I don't speak to all of you by name. I was taking notes, but I know you signed in. Not everybody said who they were, right? So uh, my apologies. So in July, I read a statement regarding critical race theory, and I really just want to reiterate that not only for our public who are present this evening, but also for our families who are at home. Critical race theory is not taught in the Vernon Township School District. It is not intended, yes, I'll, I'll expand in a minute. It's not intended for K-12 instruction. It is not tied to any funding we've received or will receive from the federal government. Critical race theory is a lens of inquiry intended for research. It is used at the university level. This theory and other methodologies are used to critically examine practices, policies, and structural actions that have contributed to marginalization of various populations. This lens of inquiry is not being taught in our schools. I know there was some reference this evening to assembly bill number 4454, which was approved on March 1st of 2021. Nowhere in the bill is critical race theory mentioned. The bill outlines things like um, appropriate, meaning um, grade level appropriate, age appropriate levels of instruction and curriculum for students, um, including things like diversity, equity, inclusion, and tolerance. No, it's not the same thing. May I please Mr. speak? Mr. Vino, just yes. please keep the conversation to the board. Certainly. Okay. Members of the public, please allow the right. superintendent to speak. And, and I thank you. But I also should say, if anybody wants to further dialogue with me, please send me an email. Okay. I can be reached at kdevino at vtsd.com. I've had some phone calls with several of you and 
you know that I'll get back to you. So, um, but I really do want to provide some context and I understand how you feel. Many of you came up very passionate. Um, and listen, I mean, I, uh, for the gentleman who spoke about reading, writing, and arithmetic, I was raised in a similar school system, right? My um, grandfather was a sergeant major with the U.S. Army. I'm very proud of that. Uh, he fought in Korea and World War II. My father was an Army veteran, and my brother is a proud U.S. Marine. We have a very strong military family background, um, and they fought for the freedoms that allow us to share our thoughts with each other. So if you feel the critical race theory is being taught, I will professionally disagree with you and invite you to send me an email. I'd be happy to talk to you more about it. And if you have questions about our curriculum, about the things that we're teaching, I'd be happy to dialogue um, in, a, in a more, maybe more, uh, when we have a little bit more time to speak to each other. Of course, I'd like to echo what Ms. Munchauer said when she talked about teaching acceptance, because our teachers do a really wonderful job of teaching children to be kind to one another, which is something I learned as a young lady. I know all of you learned from your parents. My mother always said, um, the parent is the child's first <clears throat> teacher. I'm a mom too. I completely understand the way you feel. Our teachers do everything they can to reinforce what you would teach at home as families and making sure that they are kind to one another when they are in schools. But in regards to CRT, we don't teach it in our schools, but if you wanna dialogue about it, please get in touch with me. The other thing that came up um, quite often this evening was uh, masks. Um, although I did want to, um, there was one other item in regards, and I'm so sorry because I think it was after Miss Storms, and I'm not sure of your name, but yes, Doreen. Doreen thank you. Sorry about that. I know you spoke in July, but um, I, I didn't recall that. So um, in the reopening of schools, just so that everybody's aware, um, the school district follows reopening documents that the state gives us. So this one, for example, is the road forward, and that's on the New Jersey Department of Health website. It's, it's fully accessible. It's also on the New Jersey Department of Ed website. It's a public document. It is not private. It is not only for me. It's for anyone to access. Um, so any of the um, questions or concerns, I, I think that, I think it was you who brought it up about um, any kind of um, funding or anything that was going uh, to schools or that, you know, we had to um, teach any kind of um, race or anything in regards to opening. There's nothing in this document. I can tell you that. I don't know what the federal document says. I don't follow the federal document. We follow the state document. The state guidelines has nothing of, uh, there's no reference whatsoever. Uh, in this document, this is all about COVID and the safe and successful reopening of our schools. Uh, and there's nothing in there that has anything to do um, with critical race theory or, uh, or with anything. So I just wanted to clarify that. I'll talk just a little bit about masks. There were a couple of different um, questions. I guess the first was why were we in pictures in the summertime without masks on? So I talked about this at last week's meeting. We have in New Jersey, something called the CALI. It's C-A-L-I. It's the Coronavirus Activity Level Indicator. And it's something that the Department of Health uses to help guide the schools um, and, and everybody to determine how high the levels are of COVID transmission. And it's done by counties and regions in New Jersey. So in Vernon, we are in one region of the state and the Cali index has colors, red, orange, yellow, or green. Obviously red last year, you'll probably all recall when we were masked and we were home, schools were closed, we were virtual. And at different times in the last 18 months, that Cali score has changed. I get a, C, a CDRSS report every week that tells me the number of COVID cases, the percentage of increase or decrease here in Vernon, as well as for our region. The Department of Health creates a Cali score with the corresponding color. Whatever that color looks like are what the guidelines are in what we have to do. So in June and in the summertime, we were green, which is why you saw so many pictures without masks on. Now um, we are yellow again, unfortunately. There are parts of New Jersey that are orange. What I can tell you is that August 19th, so Ms. Munchauer was very close. I think she said August 9th, but as of August 19th, 
Governor Murphy uh, signed Executive Order 251 that does now mandate masks in school. And I know that's really challenging. Um, Ms. Bucheri asked about some exceptions. I will say that Dr. McCain and I did a podcast um, in early August talking about those exceptions. A letter will go home to families um, probably by Monday so that you can exactly see what's happening. The safe return plan that was questioned um, by the last caller. Uh, the district has, um, I believe it's six months from the initial um, execution of that plan to renew it. We are required to renew it, I think by sometime in October. So please don't quote me on that, but that is a Department of Education document and a required report that I have to send to the state. So the requirement is October. We'll make sure that we update, update that, of course. Um, regarding Executive Order 251, that executive order is really specific. And as challenging as that is for, for many of you in the audience, as the superintendent, I'm required Absolutely. to not only follow um, our curriculum and our policies in the district, I'm also required to follow the law. And when Governor Murphy signed Executive 251 and has since signed Executive Order 253, which you probably heard about, that one actually mandates um, vaccinations for all eligible folks, eligible employees, school employees um, in the district effective October 19th. Um, we are, not the uh, lastly, there were a couple of other questions, I think, about, um, you know, uh, different programs in the schools, um, a, a question about a, a trauma program at the high school. I'm not sure what the in-flight um, piece is, but I, I just wanted to emphasize that uh, as far as trauma goes, uh, the pandemic has had um, ill effects on everyone, everyone in this audience, as well as our children. Uh, the only programs that we're using in our schools are to help our teachers be aware of how they can better help children. And the teachers or administrators will always, always contact parents. Yes, We are your partners in education. We do not do things in isolation without you. Our faculty and staff work very hard to communicate with families. And we welcome that as a two-way street. If you have a question, please call us. If you have a thought, please let us know. We will do everything that we can to work with you. We are blessed that you send your children to us every day. And without your children here, um, we wouldn't be able to do what we do, which I think for our teachers is educate our children uh, in, in a wonderful way. So I wanted to stress that um, for the folks that were here. And I think Dr. McKay might have a couple of comments. Right, so the first thing was um, Thanks. the concern about the program at the high school but all, all we're concerned about is um, making sure that our students are okay, making sure that um, the mental health issues that are showing up nationwide, that we're aware of them and making sure that we have services for all of our students. So I'm not sure how people have tied that to something negative, but we are um, making sure that we're all aware and uh, taking care of our kids. Secondly, um, Masks are no one's idea of a good time. Um, all of our teachers are going to have to work especially hard uh, with the masks and our students, of course, as well. But the idea simply that we can change that edict um, is um, not possible. So therefore there is a mask mandate. It changed as uh, Ms. Davino pointed out this summer and, uh, and we have followed it since then. Uh, I think there is concern um, at the high school level about the rotating schedule. The um, rotating schedule was uh, designed by the high school administration in uh, concert with uh, working with uh, teachers and uh, committee in which they worked on it. They've examined other schools that have rotating schedules or block programs. And um, they felt that this was, uh, actually they felt that last year was the year that they could do it. Um, but with COVID and everything else going on, uh, they thought that maybe this year was the year um, to try it. I, I know that some people are concerned uh, about the uh, change daily in the rotation, but I think mostly most of our students, once they start to get used to the program, uh, will start to feel comfortable with it. 
Um, I do know that there's a controversy with it, but I do also know that there's a great support uh, amongst our folks about the program as well. So I, 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 I have to say as a person, I find myself, um, I wanna say that I understand because I've been with this community for almost 40 years now and uh, never have I felt more um, ill at ease with 